so obviously language boundary is huge. Um, Lithuania and Latvia are very similar as far as linguistic properties. Not quite mutually intelligible um, languages, but enough is similar that I can understand Latvian if it's written or something like that. Um, but spoken, it's a little different. Estonian, on the other hand, is a completely different language family. It's it's close to Finnish and and not close to Lat Latvian or Lithuanian at all. No no similarities basically, except for stuff that's borrowed from other languages. Um, so there's that. Um, eth ethnically, they uh, in Estonia they're they're a lot fairer. Um, they look more Scandinavian, I guess. And in the other two countries, it's a um, little bit darker. I mean, not like dark skinned at all or, or dark hair, but, but not quite your, your elfish blonde type look. Um, another difference I guess is, um, what else? They, uh, the, the religions in the, in the three countries are, are somewhat different. Uh, Lithuania is 90 something percent Catholic and the other two are not. If I remember, they're Protestant. Um, they're different forms of Protestant. I don't remember which one's which, but um, yeah, Lithuania is, is very heavily Catholic, um, and there's basically nothing else as far as dominant religions in Lithuania. One thing I think that I really loved about Lithuania is that their culture is very nature-oriented. They I, I think it must have some sort of ancient roots, pagan roots even. It was pagan for a very long time. It's the last pagan country in Europe. Um, they, their words, their language, everything about their culture is somehow centered around animals or nature, rain, trees, the sun. I mean, their gods are, are very pagan, having to do with um, the forest and the sun and the wind and, and such, you know. And so... They just really care about nature and animals. Um, they, they love animals. And uh, I really, really liked that. Um, that's cool. Another thing, I guess, they, they serve a lot of tea, and that's pretty common. Um, they serve tea out of just about anything you can imagine, uh, in addition to the regular kinds of, of tea. I mean, I, I saw people collecting grass, you know, and, and they'd make tea out of that, which I never had personally, but I heard you can do that. And, you know, I, I saw people that would have their little, like, indoor miniature lemon trees and they would make tea out of lemon leaves, and that's actually really tasty. Um, but they can make tea out of just about anything. And um, what else tradition-wise? Um, so I guess one of their nature traditions, uh, they, they have a May festival, um, uh, and they dance around the maypole, and, and they wear their traditional Lithuanian garb that um, it looks like a lot of Eastern European countries, sort of. Uh, it's, you know, dresses and white shirts and um, kind of what you would imagine for Middle Ages. And, and they have these tassels. Um, I don't know if tassels is a good description for them, but these long, flat, embroidered pieces of cloth that would um, have intricate patterns on them that are like usually green and red patterns. Sometimes there's some, there's some blue in there and, uh, it's, it's kind of cool. I like, I like their, their festivals. They have lots of holidays in the summer. There's a, a big sea festival in, in one of the coastal cities every summer that attracts tons of people from all over Europe and they have lots of, you know, sorts of, I guess kind of like a carnival feel, but not generally rides, but there's like people dressed up and wearing masks and having fun little booths and games and that kind of thing. And, and it's, it's really fun to, to be around. Of course, as missionaries, we were like kind of annoyed by it because we're trying to, you know, proselyte and our, the street that our apartment was on was the main street for this festival. So we're like, oh, there's so many people, but we uh, had appointments to meet too. The people I remember first getting over there, and the people just seemed really, really kind of uh, gruff. Um, and I would, I was always thinking that they were like always yelling at me um, until I got to know them or uh, got to know the language better. And then I, I eventually just realized um, the people over there—they're just big pineapples. They're just kind of like 
a little bit hard on the outside, a little bit spiny, but once you get into the inside, they're so sweet, and they're the sweetest people in the world, and you end up loving them to death. Um, you really, really miss that. Um, they're very straightforward. They'll tell you like it is. They don't beat around the bush, or they don't wear any masks. Um, like, if you say, say ask them, uh, how are, how are you doing? Typical answer here in America is always like fine, even though sometimes maybe you're not. But over there, they will tell you if they're not doing fine, they'll go on a long like tangent or rant on what's going wrong. Or they'll tell you if, if it's great too. So they're very honest people. Um, uh, beer is a big part of their culture, alcohol in general. Um, sadly, um, you see a lot of drunks. Um, but... And then families, it's kind of tough, um, but there's not too many complete families there. Most of it's uh, just a, a mom with her kids. Um, you hardly ever see complete families, ever. Um, but some do's and don'ts. There's some funny ones. Um, never kick a pigeon over there, because pigeons are uh, related to the dove, and dove being a symbol of the the Holy Ghost. If you kick a pigeon, it's very offensive to them. So the pigeons know that they they rule they rule the 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 roost. They rule the city. So um, they'll just be everywhere, and you'll just end up hating pigeons. And I remember once um, there was a pigeon flying, and I was just walking down the road, and. Uh, the sidewalk and the pigeon actually would not move to get out of the way of me. I had to get it out of the way of the pigeon. Um, so they, they know that they, they own the place. Um, they never do this. Um, we do that here all the time, you know, when you're bored or something like that. But there's a very bad connotation to that over there. If you want, you can ask your trainers all about that. Um, never sit on the ground. Um, according to the old Russian women, especially, you'll go sterile. Um, never, never shake hands with someone over, like, um, over the entryway or like over a door frame. Um, you would always have to be in their house or they'd have to come out, um, and shaking hands. Um, just kind of a bad luck, good luck thing. Then, uh, there's, uh, something called the Skvozniak, which is a cross breeze and they, they hate cross breezes. So, um, oftentimes when you're on buses or on, uh, trams there, um, they'll have one whole side of their windows completely um, completely sealed so you can't open them. And then one side you can open. And the reason is so that you can't get a cross breeze that uh, if um, air goes from window one window out through the other, um, they believe that you'll get cancer or something like that. So it's kind of another funny thing. Um, another thing, taboo thing, is never a whistle because um, that's apparently you'll lose all your money. And then it's very offensive to show the bottoms of your feet. So the typical American way to cross your legs, you know, is like that. Um, but over there, you end up crossing your legs like that. Uh, I don't know if that showed that, but oh well. Um, it depended on the country where you were at uh, for their beliefs. Um, Russian Orthodox, that would be the main, If you're especially if you're Russian speaking, that's the main um, religion that you're going to be around. And they're spread all throughout the Baltics. Um, they're in each country. And then um, Estonia is very, very atheistic. It's I think it's ranked as the most atheistic country in the world. Um, but other religions are there, like Catholics. Um, and then in uh, Catholics are in, in Lithuania as well. And then um, Latvia has mostly Protestants and, like, Lutherans and people like that. And then... Um, then there's the Russian Orthodox, which is always like a big portion. Um, there, as for their belief systems, uh, they vary. They vary a lot. Um, they do. They value. Um, they value their families and people around them. But sadly, uh, like I said before, there aren't too many like complete families. Um, a lot of them believe in being extremely honest. Like I kind of mentioned before, that like you can't beat around the bush or anything like that they'll they'll tell you exactly what they think um but the people are i i you end up loving the people um and most of the time um they they choose to focus on the the negatives of life and that's kind of a tough thing over there um one thing that we always try to combat as missionaries um especially um because they've been 
oppressed so many times and recently by the Soviets, um, a lot of the people, you know, they kind of lost kind of hope and, um, kind of a lot of the happiness. And, um, so that was one of the things that we always tried to do is bring happiness. Like over there, most people wouldn't smile. And if you were smiling, they'd think that you were weird <laughs> just out in public. <clears throat> but, um, oftentimes missionaries would smile anyways. And sometimes we'd find investigators that way. Um, most oftentimes, um, oftentimes I would hear stories of missionaries that would, um, find their investigators and find members, um, people to be baptized, um, just because they were smiling or they were just appearing happy. And the people remarked that we always had a light in our eyes or that we always had a light about our face. And they always wanted to know about that. They always wanted to know why, which was really, really cool, you know, um, just to have them come up and ask, why, why are you so happy or why, like, why are you this way? Um, as for holidays, um, depends on the country where you're at. So, like, Lithuania, um, they, I swear, during the summer, they would have holidays, like, every other day or every week. It was, it was crazy. And we, I remember talking to one guy once and being like, um, what's up with all these holidays? And he's like, oh, everyone knows it's just, uh, it's just a ploy from the uh, beer companies to get people to drink more. <laughs> So that was always kind of a funny thing. Um, but there would be like weird holidays like uh, John the Baptist's birthday or something like that. And, um, but then there'd be like traditional Russian um, holidays as well. And then they'd also typically, um, depends where you were at, but um, they'd also celebrate um, Russian New Year and regular New Year. And they'd also celebrate... Russian Christmas and regular Christmas and then Russian Easter and regular Easter. And so you would just end up like having two holidays, you know, and you'd have to, you know, most of the people, they, and they celebrate our holidays, but, um, the typical Russians, they, they celebrate the Russian holidays as well. So, um, that was kind of fun. So the culture over there is, is super unique because, um, you know, just like you said, there's, you have four different cultures you're dealing with over there, especially when you're a Russian speaker. Um, because as a Russian speaker, I spent time in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, all three of them. And I spent ample time in each of them, at least six months in each country. And so saying that you have to deal with all those cultures, you know, and, you know, Lithuanian and Latvian culture are, are a little similar, but they still have major differences. And Estonian culture is very different than Latvian and Lithuanian. And Russian culture is different from all of them. <laughs> and so you have all these really unique cultures you have to deal with. Now, as a Russian speaker, obviously you're going to focus on the Russian culture in the Baltics. And it's a very prideful one. It's super interesting because they're living in the Baltics, but talking to them, you wouldn't know it. You'd think they're still living back in Mother Russia because, you know, to them, Russia is the best. It's the highest standard of anything, and it's the best country in the world, and Russia is the most amazing thing that could have happened to Earth. And if you don't understand that, then you're wrong. So, <laughs> according to Russians in the Baltics. And so it's really hard for them to get along with the native people there as well. Um, it's Again, it's a unique situation because, I mean, a lot of these Russian peoples, you know, their families didn't originate there in the Baltics. Yeah. Their families didn't originate there in the Baltics. They, what happened was when the Soviet Union took over the Baltic states, they deported a lot of the native population. So a lot of the native Estonians, Lithuanians, Latvians, and then imported a lot of uh, Russians to more Russianize the populations there. And, you know, sometimes there'd be specialists <clears throat> from different parts of the Soviet Union, and they would all you know, move there just as what the union needed, you know. Um, like I know in Estonia, there's a lot of Ukrainians there. There's a lot of Ukrainian construction workers who built a lot of buildings in Estonia. And now that the Soviet Union has fallen, though, they're they're still living there, but they're no longer have that Russian, Russian type government to identify with. And the, there's a lot of prejudice, actually, against the Russian peoples living in the Baltics. Um, People like, you know, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, um, I'm not, I'm not going to say all of them because some of them do get along very well with Russians, but a lot of them have this really resentment towards Russian people because of the way they were oppressed by the Russian government when the Soviet Union was there. You know, so the Soviet Union preached, yeah, yeah, we're all equal, we're all one, but that wasn't the case. They favored Russians way more than any other people. 
And they, in fact, persecuted and deported a lot of Estonians, Lithuanians, and Latvians. And so now that now that this, that government has fallen, now that the government is run by actual native Baltic peoples, um, the Russians there are heavily, well, I wouldn't say heavily, but they are persecuted in a lot of ways. Um, you know, they're withheld a lot of jobs. A lot of times Russians have to do like the lower kind of class jobs and stuff like that. Um, I just remember a couple instances where people told me, you know, if, if you're going up for a job against, a, let's just say you're in Lithuania, you go up against a Lithuanian candidate, um, a lot of times the employer won't even look at your resume, he'll just look at your last name. And if you have a Russian last name and he has a Lithuanian last name, guess who he's going to pick? The Lithuanian guy. Um, and again, that's not the case everywhere there, not all the time, but from a lot of people we talked to, that seemed to be the sentiment there. And so, and also another problem was, you know, the Russians living there, again, they were so prideful about their home country and their home culture, which I mean is good. It's good to take pride, obviously, in where you come from. But the problem was it got in the way of them adapting and, you know, integrating with peoples that were of the Baltics. And so you have these two very distinct cultures, the culture of people in the Baltics and the Russian pride culture, and they clash. They don't mix at all. And, you know, and they both hate each other <laughs> because one hates the other. You know, the, the Baltic culture hates the Russian culture because they felt like they were so oppressed by Russians for so long under the Soviet Union. And the Russian culture hates them because they're not Russia and because they feel persecuted um, right now. And so you have to understand that going in. You know, there were a lot of times I would try to, I only spoke Russian. You know, I didn't speak Lithuanian or Latvian, Estonian. And I'd be contacting on the streets and I'd see a, you know, Latvian man and, and I knew most Latvians spoke Russian anyways, so I'd try to contact him, and they would get super offended, and they would yell at me and get angry, and they'd be like, why are you talking to me in Russian? You know, I'm a Latvian, and I'm proud of it. You know, we're no longer oppressed by those people, you know, and they had some choice words, you know, for him and stuff, and, um, and I was just, I was just like, I'm just a missionary, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not involved in this, but, you know, going in, you have to understand those kind of cultural differences and go along with that. Um, and it's hard because you want to be there for everyone. You want to help all people and, you know, but as a Russian speaker, you are there mainly to teach the Russians, you know, and you have to understand that. And you kind of have to make a choice that you want to be really involved in that culture, you know, and less with the others. I mean, obviously it's good to make friends with everyone there. And I, there were so many like Latvians and Estonians and Lithuanians that I loved while, we were there, while I was there. And they were great great people, amazing people, you know, but being a Russian speaker, you know, my job, you know, my, my calling was to focus on, on those people. Um, Russian cuisine is interesting. Um, there's some parts of it that aren't too different from ours. It's very bland though. So if, you know, if you're, if you're used to tons of Mexican food or, you know, spicy Asian food, uh, you're, you know, you're going to be kind of disappointed because a lot of our meals were just uh, boiled potatoes and dill and, you know, or, um, just cuts of meat with a little bit of salt. And I mean, that's what they eat and they love it. And you just gotta kind of be prepared for that. Um, but the borscht is to die for Ukrainian borscht is incredible. And it's really good hot. If they can't, they'll, sometimes they'll serve it to you cold, but if you can get it to serve it to you hot. So it's beet soup, which I know a lot of people are like, ew, beets, you know, but it's got lots of good stuff in there. And believe me, on a cold Baltic winter day, you want some good hot Porsche and you just want to just want to gulp it down and it will warm your, your body and soul. So try to get involved with as much cultural activities as you can. We had the, we had the cool privilege to go to a wedding, like a Russian style wedding while we were there. And they had it in our branch building, so it was funny. But they got to do all these cool Russian traditions. And if you just really immerse yourself in that, you're going to have so much more fun. You know, I saw some missionaries who were, I don't know, they just didn't really take well to the culture and they still wanted to be like American, you know, and I mean, which is great, you know. And But I just feel like you're never going to forget how to be American. So why not take this opportunity to like really delve into a culture that's not your own and really like learn to love it and love the food and the, the cool celebrations, the parties they have. And again, the wedding was so much fun. There's all this fun stuff they did. Like they'd yell, kiss, kiss, kiss as loud as you can, like every like five minutes and like for the bride and groom to kiss. It was hilarious. And so we'd always go, Gorka, Gorka every time. So just immerse yourself in that kind of stuff. If there's ever opportunity to go to a traditional Russian event, or if you can make a church activity into like a cultural Russian event and get the members involved. That is the coolest thing ever. Always, always try to get involved in that stuff because you, it's just going to make your mission so much more fun and you can come on with cool stories and like, 
cool traditions and recipes that other people don't have and you can share it with people here and it's just super fun. So.